Well, it is 11.30, so we're going to get started this morning. And I'm glad you're here. I'm glad every one of you is here this morning. We're going to continue on with getting to know Jesus, number tw- number 10, I believe. <clears throat> getting to know Jesus, number 10. We weren't on the air last week, but thank God that uh, he met with us anyway, even though we wasn't on the air, and we're glad to welcome back folks that are listening. No, Brother Wiley's listening in this morning. Uh, many other people probably busy opening presents and things of that nature, but I'm thankful for those who are tuned in, and maybe some will tune in later. But uh, anyway, John chapter three, and we're going to read. We're going to read actually 21 verses this morning, and then we're going to go back. We're going to pray, and we'll go back and we'll look at them this morning. But let's begin there, John chapter three, and verse one. The Bible says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the king, into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but thou, and but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and answered unto him and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak. That we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Let's go to him in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you this morning. And Lord, we we seek your presence. We seek your power. Lord, we seek for you to do a work in our lives today. Lord, we come because we love you. We come because we worship you and we adore you. And Lord, I know, I know, I can only speak for me, but I know, Father, I fall so short of what you expect. Lord, I know that I don't do all that I should do as a Christian. And Lord, I ask you to have mercy on me. Lord, I pray you to help me to become the man that I know you want me to be. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you strengthen each one of us, Lord, that we might be better, more pleasing in your sight, that we might honor you more than we do now. Lord, I pray you'd fill my 
my heart and my mind, my soul, Lord, with, with exactly what you want me to say. Lord, may it come out my mouth in a pleasing manner. Father, pleasing to you. Lord God, I pray you'd help me to remember everything. And Lord, help me to preach. Lord, I pray, Father, that Jesus be glorified and magnified. Lord, I thank you for each one who's listening. Lord, here and, and wherever they may be listening on the Internet. Father, I just pray your blessing go forth. Touch lives and encourage. Lord, Just we just want to give you praise for Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for the greatest gift ever given. And Lord, I just I just give you honor now and, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So as we get back here to chapter three and verse one, this is um you know, we talked last week about Jesus cleansing the temple and uh and he's there in Jerusalem and after all this has taken place the Bible says, you know, he didn't he didn't stick around there with with those who who would had believed on him and at the past I mean at the uh after after what this is after the things that had taken place we talked about last week with the cleansing of the temple and everything. Uh said it, you know, backing up there to verse twenty three, twenty four and twenty five, the Bible says now when he now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover the feast and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto him because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man because he knew what was in man. And he knew, I believe he knew that they were only going to follow him so far. And so he didn't commit himself and, and, and stay there and teach those, those followers uh, because, uh, quite frankly, I guess he, what, I, what I read and what I understand, he knew they weren't going to follow him to begin with. And, and it immediately goes here in verse 3, or chapter 3, immediately the scripture goes to, a different scene, a different situation. It's not happening during the day like the cleansing of the temple happened. Now we've gone to a scene at night. And the Bible says there was a man of the Pharisees, and let's remember, let's realize who that is. This is a very important man. This is a man of power, a man of, of wealth and influence, a man named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He wasn't just anybody. He was an important, very, very, very influential, very important Man, he was a he was a a part of of uh, those who eventually uh, sent Jesus to be crucified. I mean, he was a part of of that group of, of Pharisees, the influential people in Jerusalem. And so the Bible says that the same came to Jesus by night. And I've read and I've heard so many things on that. I've heard well, he came to Jesus by night because he was a secret disciple. He didn't want anybody to know. That, that he was interested in the gospel, that he was not, I mean, that, that, that he was ashamed, basically, to come to Jesus. I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I think he wanted an audience with Jesus where there weren't other people around. I, I tend to think of it maybe that way. He, he, he didn't want to be distracted. He was, a very, he was a very important man. He was a very business-minded man, uh, a no-nonsense kind of man if he, if, in the position that he was that he was in. I don't believe he would have been a man who would have walked up to Jesus in the middle of a, a great crowd of people and tried to have this conversation. So it could have been that, G, that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night when the rest of the crowds were gone, when Jesus was, was maybe uh, sitting by the fire. I don't know where he was or exactly how it was that he came to him, but he came and he found Jesus. And uh, the Bible says that, that he came to Jesus. So he went and found Jesus at night. And he said unto him, Rabbi. And that word rabbi there means teacher. So he had been listening. He'd been listening to what all Jesus had been teaching. He'd been listening to what all Jesus had been saying. He'd seen all that Jesus had been doing. And he said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. I want to remember, I want to remind you of that where the Bible tells us that, that the Jews require a sign, but the Gentiles seek after wisdom. <laughs> the, Gen, the Jews require a sign. In other words, the Jews were very impressed with miracles. They were very impressed with any kind of miraculous thing that took place. And, and God made it so. God made it that way. I don't know why God made it that way, but God made it that way. If Gentiles required a sign, I expect there'd be miracles still going on all around us. But the Bible says the Jews, uh, the Gentiles, or the Greeks seek after wisdom. So God, God, all those miracles that God was doing were for the Jews, and a lot of that 
ceased. I'm not saying God doesn't still do miracles, but but there was not a need for it. So the Nicodemus had seen Jesus working these miracles, and and he was very impressed. And he said, "You know what? This, there's something to this. This is not just this is not just Johnny come lately down the road going going to teach us something. This is not just some new guy come now, come come uh, come around here and want to impress us. This is real because listen, the things he's doing can't nobody else do. And and so we understand that God has to be with him, or he couldn't do the things that he's doing." And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, and that word verily means of a truth, or truthfully, I say unto thee, because see, I want you to understand something. He came, what he had said to Jesus at that point was like, Look, Jesus, we, I, I, know, I, know you're, I, know you're, uh, I know you're from God. I mean, he was bragging on Jesus. Understand that. He came to him, and, here, and he's a powerful man. Understand this too. This is a... This is this is an examination of a soul winning experience with Jesus Christ is what this is. Let's don't miss what we're looking at. This is this is the, the this is reaching people with the gospel one oh one. Okay? We're watching how Jesus did it. And this man came and when he came to him, again, he's powerful, he's influential, and he's saying to Jesus all the right things. Okay? And and I'm sure he was that way with everybody. There are people of wealth, influence, and power, and they always want to butter people up, you know, because uh, they try to use their influence and get somebody else's influence. And, and he came to Jesus, say, hey, look, at we, you know, hey, you do all these miracles. Nobody can do this if God's with you. We know you're from God. And so Jesus turned to him, and he simply cut him off and said this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. See, Nicodemus is saying, look here, I know you're from God. I know you're from God. I know God. Hey, I know what God does. I'm a, I'm a teacher of the law. I know, I know what God does. You have to be from God. And what he's saying to him is simply this. You don't know God. You, you think you know God, but you don't know. Jesus is letting him know. You may be religious, but you're not, you're not a Christian. You're not a born-again believer. You know a lot. There's lots of this. These people all outside these doors, going up and down these highways, they know a lot about God, and they may call themselves religious. They may think they're 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 really close to God. But listen, the Bible, Jesus said, except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. He's not going to understand the thing of things of God. First Corinthians two fourteen. Listen to what it says. First Corinthians two fourteen. Let me find it real quickly. The Bible says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And a man before he is born again does not even have a living spirit. A man before he's born again, he's nothing but a but a but a body and a soul and, and he can't understand it. You don't have a unless you have the Spirit of God living in you, you don't have a way to understand the things of the Spirit of God. You can't. You can't know them. And that's what Jesus was telling him. There's no way for you to even see the things of the kingdom of God. You can't understand this, what, what you're trying to tell me. You're, you're, you're impressed, but you don't know anything yet. And Nicodemus said, and Jesus, notice, Jesus said the words, except a man be born again. And Nicodemus said unto him, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Mama, aren't you glad? You don't have to have me again at this point. I was rough enough the first time. I was nine pounds and eight ounces, and I think she, she didn't think she was ever going to have me. Well, imagine her trying to have me again. wouldn't work. I'm bigger than she is. And Nicodemus says, mine was rattling around, and he said, now, wait a minute. This ain't plausible, Jesus. How are you going to say i got to be born again? I mean, I, I, I can't, my mama can't have me again. And Jesus, and again, Jesus made Jesus' point for him, didn't he? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> There's a lot of schools of thought on what that means right there, of water. There are those who teach that that means born of water, the washing of water by the word, the the Word of God working in a man, and, and that may be true. 
It may mean that the the, spirit, the word of God, which is uh, the Bible, compares it to again to water. It may be that the that he's talking about the water of the word of God has to work in a man in, in order to bring him to the point to where he understands that he needs to be born again and the spirit of God bring him into the family of God, lead him to Jesus. It may be that it means that. Then again, I, I don't believe it has anything to do with baptism because a man can't be man's not to be baptized until he is saved to begin with, until he's born again. But perhaps it means this, and I've always thought maybe it means, well, when a person is born naturally into this world, they are born in a bag of water. They come into a bag of water. A woman's water breaks. So they're in water, and they're born of water the first time. I believe, I, now maybe I'm wrong, and if I'm wrong, I don't think it's going gonna, it's gonna to change anybody's salvation at all that I'm wrong on this one little little point right here. I don't think it's going to hurt anybody if I am wrong. But, you know, when it says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, that's two different births. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Well, I, I've had two different births. first one was in 1968. The second one was in 1975. Because Jesus goes on to say in verse 6, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. When I was born of the flesh, I came into this world out of a bag of water. Born of the spirit is spirit. The second time I got born again, Mama didn't have well, she was there. She told me how, but she didn't she didn't do it for me. She didn't have anything to do with it other than her being there. The second time I got born, it was because God birthed me. I was brought into his family. I was brought in her family when she gave birth to me, but I was brought into God's family when he gave spiritual birth to me when I came and I was born again. And Jesus said, marvel not. Don't think this is, don't think this is amazing. Uh, don't, don't let this go past you. Don't let this blow your mind. Listen, don't think this is too hard for you when I say to you that you must be born again. And listen, I'd say that to everybody that's listening this morning, everybody that will ever listen to this message, there ain't no way to get to God except you be born again. There's no religion in this world that will get you to God. There's no amount of doing anything that will ever get you to God. There's no amount of, uh, uh, of not doing something that will get you to God. The Bible says you must be born again. And Jesus went on to say this in verse 8. He said, the wind bloweth where it listeth. That means the wind blows where it wants to blow. And thou hearest the sound of it but canst not tell where it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born in the Spirit. <laughs> I stand outside on a windy day, and I hear the wind blowing. Sometimes it blows the heart through stuff. You can hear it whistling. But you don't know which way. You say, well, I know which way it's coming. I lick my finger and hold it up. I can tell which way it's coming. But you don't know where it came from. It may have swirled around before it got to you. <laughs> and you don't know where it's going after it blows. I mean... Yeah, it usually goes from the southwest to the northeast, but you don't know which way it's taken. I mean, <clears throat> we know it's there, but we can't see it. We can't grab it. We can't hold it. It's beyond our it's beyond our natural ability to do anything with. <clears throat> you know what? <clears throat> the Spirit of God works the same way. I like what he said here because look here. You don't decide when you're going to get saved. You can't decide. It's not, it's not in your control. It's not in your grasp. The wind blows where it wants to, and the Spirit of God deals with who he wants to. It's not about me or you and what we decide to do and our plans. I've heard people say, well, when I get older, I'm going to get saved. Or, or, or when this happens, I'm going to get saved. Or, or I'll, maybe I'll get saved later on this year or something like that. Listen, it ain't for you to decide. If God's dealing with you, it, it, listen, if God's dealing with you now is the time. It's not, it's not about later. You, you, can't, you don't decide when you want to get saved. God is the decider of that. And he draws a person, and he shows them that they need to be born again. Nicodemus answered, and, and he, he listened to Jesus say that, and he answered, and he said unto him, How can these things be? What in the world are you talking? I mean, Jesus, how how's all this work? I don't look, I don't get it. And notice what Jesus said to him. Jesus answered and said to him, "Art thou master of Israel? Knoweth not these things? Here you are. You're 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 a very important man. You're a teacher. You teach you teach the people of Israel. I mean, you're supposed to know this. 
book inside and out. You know the Old Testament inside and out, and you don't even know these things? And you call yourself a teacher? How many people stand behind pulpits this morning and don't understand how to be saved all over this country? How many false teachers stand up and tell you it's all about money, that Jesus will make you rich, that Jesus will give you everything you want materially? How many of them stand up there and try to, try to claim that you need some other kind of gift other than Jesus? How many of them stand up there and try to tell you that you've got to be good enough to go to heaven, that you've got you to work your way there? There's people all over this country who stand behind a, uh, behind a piece of wood and have a Bible in front of them and yet don't even know what they're preaching. Very much like Nicodemus, here he was, supposedly a man of God, supposedly a teacher of God, and yet he himself didn't know how to get to God. Jesus is just pointing out to him one thing after another. You don't know what you're talking about. And I want to tell you something. This wasn't no easy case. You talk about somebody hard to get, get saved. This is, this, is a, this is a very, again, the more powerful, the more, the more wealthy, the more influential a man is, the less he, he sees his own need of his soul. And so this is, again, Jesus is having to break him down and show him that he is not he is not nearly as powerful, not nearly as influential, not nearly as important as he thought he was. So he says, hey, look, you don't even know these things? Jesus goes on saying, verse 11, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know. In other words, we're not going to go around talking about stuff we don't know anything about. That's what Nicodemus have been doing. That's what the rest of the fellows and the Pharisees have been doing. They go around talking about stuff they don't even know anything about. They claim to know it. They're supposed to know it. But again, like we said before, we talked about last week about how Jesus went into the temple and he cleansed the temple. Why? Because the people who were supposed to be representing God were there representing a political idea. They're waiting on a Messiah who was going to come in and take over and run out all the Romans and set up his kingdom in Israel right then and there. That's what they were waiting on. They weren't waiting on a savior. They were waiting on a political conqueror to overthrow. So they weren't, even, they weren't even thinking right. They weren't thinking spiritual. They were thinking earthly. And that's what Jesus is pointing, and that's the way most people are. Most people do not think spiritual things. They can't. Why? Because they do not have the Spirit of God living in them. So they think of things earthly. They think of this world. They don't think of what's going to come after this world. They have make no preparation for it. Again, like I said, all those prosperity preachers, they're thinking about this world right now. They're not thinking about the world to come. And Jesus is pointing this out to this man. You don't know what you're talking about. We know. He said, we speak that. We do know. Hey, listen, I'm telling you right now, I'm speaking something this morning I know. And it's something you know if you're saved. Listen, we've got something that's concrete, that's real. It's not just an idea. It's something real. It's rooted in reality more than, more than anything. He said, and we testify that we have seen. There's no doubt about it. God saves sinners. He said, and you receive not our witness. Up to that point, he hadn't. Up to that point, he couldn't even get it. He didn't even understand. He was curious. He knew something was going on, but he couldn't get his mind around what? He knew that there was some, some big commotion around Jesus, and he, and he knew, hey, wait, that, if, if there's something like that happening, and, and, and it's changing people's lives, and there's mirac miraculous stuff going on, maybe I need to find out what it is. There was a curiosity that, that had started in him, and the Holy Spirit of God had shown him, listen, you need to get to Jesus to find out what it is. Listen, there are people everywhere, there are people everywhere around you that have a curiosity about Jesus, and they think to themselves from time to time, you know, I probably ought to find out what there is to this being saved business, but they don't know how. And that's where we lie. We know how. We have the answers. Amen? And we need to pay attention to how he's done it. And Jesus said, if, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? You, you can't even understand the things, the earthly things I'm telling you, much less, much less telling you of spiritual things. And he said, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now notice verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He's speaking about an event that took place while the children of Israel 
were walking through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And let's turn over and look at it this morning. Numbers 20, 5 through 9. Numbers 20, 5 through 9. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers 20, 5 through 9. Now, what's Jesus doing? He's going back to something that Nicodemus ought to know. Nicodemus, again, he's a student of the law. He know, Listen, and, and by the way, Numbers is part of the Pentateuch, the law, the first five books of Moses. He's taking him to something that he ought to know well. Because here he says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Verse 5 of, of chapter 21 of Numbers. And the people, that's the children of Israel out in the desert, spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore, or why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth, loatheth this light bread. You know what? They, they, were, they, were, they, were sick of, of, they were sick of God feeding them manna. They were sick of they were sick of all God's provisions. They were complaining about how God was doing things for them. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it on a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now I want you to understand something. Jesus said just like that, As Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The the curse was sin, and God sent those snakes to bite those people, to kill them. Sin's going to destroy everybody that doesn't turn to Christ. And so God put a uh, that brass serpent, had Moses put that brass serpent on a pole. Jesus became sin for us. You understand that? The snakes were the problem. The snake was a cure. Sin was the problem. Jesus became sin to be the cure for us. He was placed on a pole on a cross, just as that serpent was placed. That serpent was placed on a pole. What did they have to do to to be healed? They simply had to look and live. They had to look and believe that that was going to that was going to cure them from the serpent's bite. Let me tell you something. What does it take to be saved from your sin? It takes you turning from that sin and looking unto Jesus and being born again. And what is he doing? He's bringing this out to Nicodemus. He's bringing out an illustration to show him. Jesus is doing the very same thing that every preacher does behind a pulpit. He uses illustrations to teach. Jesus is showing this man something that he already knew and bringing it out for him to see. That whosoever... Believeth in him, should not perish, but have eternal life. He's going to use both words, eternal and everlasting, in verses 15 and 16, in order to show us they mean the very same thing. <clears throat> that whosoever believeth in him, listen, that means whoever lo- quits, quits trying to figure it out in this life, quits trying to, to, to do it themselves, quits try, trying to, to uh, please God in their own righteousness, which will never do. No, the person that believes. It, it's, it's not a matter of, 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 of do I believe enough or, did I, or not. Listen, belief is belief. Amen? He's able. He's able to save them unto the uttermost that come unto him for salvation. In verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, today, all over all over this country, there's wrapping paper scattered all over floors. There's boxes 
and scotch tape ripped and bows scattered and ribbons all over the place. People are opening gifts today. Matter of fact, there's some in here can't wait to open a gift later. But you know what? What we're talking about here is the greatest gift that was ever given to anybody. And let's look at the giver for a second. For God so loved the world that he gave, he didn't have to. God didn't have to. God could have made a million more worlds just like this one. He could have He could have done it over and over and over and over and done it all different sorts of ways and ways we couldn't even imagine. But God didn't do it that way. God designed it the way he designed it so that he could be the giver. He could have made us to where we couldn't sin. He could have made us to where we would have been perfect all the time and never done anything wrong. He could have made us so we would have never failed him. We would have never gone through life knowing grief or sorrow, sadness, any of those any pain of his life, jealousy. Uh, we could, we, I mean, we'd have never gone through life feeling these horrible emotions that we go through. But I'm going to tell you something. God made us the way he made us. He allowed us. He allowed man to sin so that he would be able to be the loving, giving God. So that people would have to choose him. People would have to love him on purpose. People would have to want him. Listen, God did it the way he did it, and his ways are a whole lot of a whole lot further than our ways. They're above our ways. His thoughts above our thoughts. We don't always understand why God did it the way he did it, but God designed it that way for a reason. God designed it because God's a giving God. God's a loving, giving God, and he wanted to give us the very best that he had. I want you to think about the gift for just a minute. God gave his only begotten son. I don't know that I could have done that. I don't know that I could... That I could that I could give my son to die for somebody else. I, I tell you what, I'm amazed at people that have sons in the military. They send them to die. I, I can't even fathom that. That I could do that. I don't love this country enough to have my son die for them. I, I just don't. I don't. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, maybe I'm bad for that. But I don't. I don't even love this country enough to let my son die. I can't imagine loving somebody else enough to let my son die for them. But God did. God did. God sent him down here to live in a body apart from him in heaven. God, God, it just boggles my mind how much God loves me. It boggles my mind how much God loves you to do what he did, to let Jesus, to, to not only let him come down here and live, but to let him be hated and scorned and mocked. God's own creation turned against his son. God's own creation hated him. God's own creation spat upon him, called him horrible names, beat him with their fists, whipped him with whips, and nailed him to a cross, and then stepped back and, and, and mocked him, hurling insults at him, making fun of him. But yet that was the gift. That was the gift that was given to us. I can't imagine what it was like for God to see his son hang on that cross like that. But that's love. That's love. Your mind can't even wrap itself around it right now. As much as you'd like to, your mind can't wrap itself around that thought. How much love God has for you. Every one of us in this room ought to be in hell right now. Every one of us deserve it. Ain't a one of us in this room is good enough to get to God. Ain't a one of us listening on the Internet that's good enough to come to God. Yet God loves you, and he knew what you needed way before you ever knew what you needed. That's what I want to mention next, the need. What would I do if God didn't love me? What, what would I do if, if God didn't want to save me? What could I do? There'd be nowhere to go. I have a need that's so great that I can't even I can't even begin to think what would happen if it wasn't for Jesus. If God didn't love me like that. If he looked down and he said, You know, Brandon, he's a waste of time. He's a waste of my creative power. And so he's not worth saving. I'm thankful God's not like that. I'm thankful God's a loving God. He's a loving, giving God. He's a, he's a loving God who saw my need. 
I love that song, He Looked Beyond My Fault and Saw My Need. God loved me in spite of my sins. <clears throat> but God commendeth, or he showed, he demonstrated his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even though as vile as we are. I mean, I, I don't want you to dwell on it too much, but if you, if you sat and thought just for a little bit of some of the worst things you've ever done in your life, God loves you in spite of that. God loves you in spite of the whole accumulation of all of it. God still loves you in spite of that. And I want you to think about this. Not only not only the giver, not only the need and the gift, but the recipient of that gift. God's not stingy. God, the Bible says that whosoever. That means the worst among us. You go out and you find the worst, most despicable human being that you could find on the face of this earth, and there are some that are more vile than we could even begin to comprehend. You look at the stuff that goes on over in the Middle East. You look at the stuff that goes on downtown Chicago. You look at the stuff that goes on in New York City. You look at the stuff that goes on here in our own town. I mean, listen, there is vileness everywhere. The most deepest, darkest, disgusting, vile human being. God would save their soul. I've had people say to me, and when I've tried to explain this to them out, and I was trying to witness the people at the door, and I shared with them, I said, you know, God would, God would save Charles Manson if Charles Manson would humble himself before God and repent and turn to Jesus and believe and be born again. God would, God would say, and, I, and I've, I've said this before, I said, you know, I've even heard that, that Jeffrey Dahmer, the horrible man that murdered people and he ate them, he was a, he was a cannibal, that, that he got saved while he was in prison. And I've had somebody say to me, well, I wouldn't want to go to, pri- I wouldn't want to, go to heaven with somebody like that. I've heard people say that. I wouldn't want to be in heaven with somebody like that. Can I tell you something? There ain't nobody any better than anybody else. We are all capable of the absolute worst. <coughs> God's gift got everybody's name on it. God wants to give it to everybody if only they'd receive it. And let's look at the value of the gift. It's everlasting. It never decreases in value. And I know I've said this hundreds of times, but it's the most valuable thing that was ever, ever bought, which makes us extremely valuable to God because God spent more on us than he's ever spent on anything. He gave us the most valuable gift that was ever given, worth more than anything in this world, the blood of Jesus Christ. And he paid our sin debt with it. I wish y'all would get more excited about this, amen? I do, I really do. I wish we would get more excited about the fact that we're born again. I wish we could smile about it anyway a little bit, amen? Listen, we've got, we've got something that, that, that many people in this world don't have, but they need it. They don't know they need it, but they need it. Amen? Listen, I'm not going to hell this morning. I am not going I am not going to hell. Amen? I ain't I can't go to hell. Why? Because I've been given this gift. And this gift fixed it all. The value of it. I can't even measure it. His love's unending. You say, What if you mess up? What if you do something horrible? God still loves me in spite of it. Hey, listen, he's not happy with what I've done. But listen, Jesus' blood runs deeper than anything that I've ever done. His blood has more cleansing power than I have power to stain. Verse 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. (coughs) Listen, people look at God's Word and say, Oh, it's just a book of do's and don'ts. It's just do's and don'ts. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Jesus didn't come to condemn us. He came to save us. Amen. Jesus didn't come to push you under further and say, you're rotten, you're horrible. Stay down there. No, Jesus came to say, I want to lift you out of that and lift you above that and give you new life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He wants to give us life and and to have it more abundantly. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to let the world know it was already condemned. And he came to save the world if they believe on him. 
Verse 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. Amen. No matter how much the devil wants to tell me that I am, no matter how much he wants to tell me God's sick of me, no matter how much he wants to say, but look at all your sins. Look, at you You fall down all the time. And he does tell me that. He reminds me of my weakness. He reminds me of this old flesh and how, how it is. But he can't do a thing about it because I believed on Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And because of that, I'm not condemned. God set me free. The devil can't ever take me back. The Bible says, but he that believeth not is condemned already. <clears throat> Poor souls out there that don't that have not been born again, they're already condemned. They're walking dead men and women. They have no hope for the future. They have no hope of eternal life because they've not believed on the only begotten Son of God. They've rejected the gift. They don't want it. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. Jesus Christ, the light of the world, came into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And they said, no, I don't want Jesus. I don't want, I don't want to clean up. I don't want to walk away from the things that I love to do. I love this world and this world and the things of this world and I don't want Jesus. That's what they say. They may not say it outside of their, of their mouth. It, it's going on in their head. It's going on in their heart. That they don't want they don't want Jesus. Not now. Oh, I'll get saved later. And that what old what's his name said? I can't think of his name. He said, I wanna I wanna have a more convenient season, I'll call for thee. Agrippa. Yeah, when 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 the things work out better and I ain't got so much going on, then I'll see about getting saved. No. It's now or never. It's when Christ calls upon you. <clears throat> for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. That's why this world doesn't want Jesus. Because this world's evil. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. When he comes under the word of God, listen, when the word of God is preached and the word of God goes forth, it, it lets us know what we are. God's word puts his finger on it. Listen, Christ didn't come into the world to condemn the world. <coughs> but the word of God does. The word of God condemns the world. The word of God puts his finger right on our sin. The Holy Ghost of God comes behind it and says, yes, you're guilty. <clears throat> and I'll finish up here. But he that doeth truth, that means he has a heart to want to do right. He, he, wants, he wants to be right with God. That's the one that looks at himself. That's the one that looks at himself and sees his sin before God and finds himself guilty before God. Sees that great need that he has. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. Again, he sees his sin as ugly as it can be. And he turns from it and comes to the light and says, Lord, I need to be saved. And his deeds made manifest that they are wrought in God. He wants to come to God and turn himself over to God and say, Lord, I'm nothing without you. And I need you in everything that I do. And when a person comes to God like that and a person comes and, 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 and lays his sin down before God and says, Lord, I need to be washed of my sin. I need to be made clean. And God washes that soul from his sin and he's made a child of God and his spirit's brought to life. From that moment on, that person has God's power living inside of them. And from that moment on, their deeds need not be the deeds of the flesh. Their deeds need not be the way it always was before. They are a new creature in Christ Jesus. And from that moment on, with God riding along inside of us, there is no, no limit to what can be done through us if we'll simply turn ourselves over to him and let that gift not just be a, oh, well, like so many do. How many times this morning has this already happened? They've got that nice present, and they looked at it. Oh, it looks so nice. And they ripped into it, and somebody held up a sweater and went, oh, and laid it aside and grabbed another one. Too many people use their salvation like that. Oh, they were excited. To, they were excited when they got saved, but after they got saved, they oh, laid laid it aside and went on about their life. He said, "That's like the ones Jesus said he wouldn't commit himself to them, so they weren't gonna follow after him." Let me tell you something. I want Jesus to commit himself to me. 
I, w- I want his presence and his power every day of my life. I don't want to try to do it without him. I want to get the most out of this gift that God's given me. I want, I want what I do to, to honor him. I, I don't want to dishonor God. I want, God I, want, I want to be just as thankful today for the gift that he gave me in 1975 as I was that night, but I got it. I want to let him know my appreciation for the gift that he's given me. I want it to show in the daily life that I live. I want it to be, be heard on my lips what God has done for me. I want to give him glory for what he's done. I want you to consider that this morning. I want you to, as we bow our heads to pray here in just a minute, I want you to think about what God has done in your life. I want you to think about what he has given to you. And I want you to examine, not measure yourself by me or anybody else, but I want you to measure yourself by what God's word has told you and shown you. Are you, are you thankful for what you have? Are you thankful for what he's given you? Do you let other people know how thankful you are? Do you give him the glory and the praise that he's due? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you this morning for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, this morning that Jesus is the greatest gift that's ever been given. And, Lord, that means that you sure do love us a whole lot. You love us more than we could ever even comprehend that you would give him to us and that we would be able to be your children What a thrill, what a gift, what an awesome privilege it is to be a child of God. Lord, forgive us for not not knowing how to express it any better than we do. Forgive us, Father, that we've heard it so often, Lord, it becomes dull of our hearing almost. Oh, Lord, forgive us. May it be just as thrilling, just as fresh every time we consider the fact that we've been washing the blood of the Son of God. May we never get tired of hearing it. May we never ever grow weary of telling it. And Lord, may it, may it every day we live, every moment we live, may it be impressed upon us, Lord, to walk according to this salvation we have. Father, forgive us for our failures. Forgive us, Lord, for not appreciating what you've given us like we should. Lord, I just pray that you that you, as we go on about our day, Lord, as we as we leave from here, Lord, may we leave here thankful and Lord, if, if if we don't get another gift today, Lord, if nothing if if, if nothing comes our way that's, that's pleasing to us, Lord, may we sit back and be very very extremely thankful for the gift of salvation. And Lord, we give you praise and glory, and we thank you for it now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.